God is good, isn't he? And you know, you know, I don't know how much we should be aware how good God is to us uh, because we get so distracted by all the our surroundings. We got so many things going on around us. The coronavirus, that 45 lies about you. You don't know whether you got it or not. And and, and, and not to be facetious, but there, there are so many things that are distracting. Uh, and unless you are intentionally looking for God and the Holy Spirit, you, you won't accidentally get it. Yeah, and most of us know that. You, you got to be on purpose with an intent. And like Jesus said, looking to the author and finisher. If you're not on, on, on looking purposely, you're not going to accidentally find Jesus. You, you're not going to just stumble up on him. Well, look here, I found, no, 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 it don't happen like that. To seek Jesus. And if you don't have that purpose and intent, your, your good looks won't drive you. I don't know how I got on that, but it's because we get so distracted. And, and, and we just take things for granted. We just dancing along lackadaisical in life. Let me tell you something. Uh, and, and as much as I love the Lord and as much as I love this crowd, I love the Church of Christ, we're not going to accidentally get to heaven. If you get there, it's going to be on purpose. And I know we used to sing the song, sweep in through the... You ain't going to sweep nowhere. If you sweep, you're going the opposite direction. But Jesus said that. Broad is the way that lead unto destruction... He said, many are going to sweep. That's where the sweeping is going to be. Now, if you want to be swept, you're going in the wrong direction. But straight is the way, and narrow is the path that lead unto righteousness. And Jesus said, and few shall, few, few shall, few shall find it. So if you go to heaven, it ain't going to be on accident. You ain't going to just get a, look, look here, I made a bit with Jesus. No, 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 it won't happen that way. If you don't have a passion to go, a purpose, you're not driven by your purpose, you won't get there. Now, I know that sounds harsh, for, especially in this day and time. That, yeah, I'm talking always talking about people going to hell. Well, the Bible talks about it. I'm not on that. I'm not on that. I'm not going to bother that. God bless you. Good to see you. And uh, they left me a few minutes. I told Richard, just sing. Just, just sing. Sometimes it's good to just sing. It's all right to arouse the spirit. And, you know, we need that. Amen. We work all, work all week. We come burdened down. Family, friends, job. You, we need the, our spirits lifted. In fact, this should be, we should take advantage. This should be our revival. Good to have it. Good to have it. Listen, listen, listen. Appreciate Brother Crosby for reading that scripture. And someday he's going to preach that. But I ain't preaching it this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Crosby. God bless Elder Crosby. But turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Um. Sometimes you start digging in God's word and you just can't turn it loose. After I got through with all of my duties on yesterday, I, I had already started digging in this lesson. <clears throat> and I had several duties to, to do yesterday. And then one we always have on Saturdays, uh, doing basketball, we got to stop and watch Kentucky. Uh, and my sister fell ill yesterday, and we do thank Priest Campbell for asking for prayers. We ask you to pray for her. But um, I start digging into this, 
and like I said, if you start digging and you sincere, you 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 can't get away. I want to start reading a little bit, give you a subject. I'm not going to develop much. I know I'm not. But in Hebrews chapter six, how often we we read all of this, but do we see the power in it? Uh, I want to start in verse 9 of Hebrews chapter 6. If you have your Bible or your device, keep up with us because I think there's some good stuff. Particularly, I, I, I would encourage you, and it's not mandatory, but I would encourage you to bring a Bible because there are some things that you can't, you can't highlight your phone. You can put it on the screen, but but you can highlight your Bible, so if you need to go back and investigate, what I'm encouraging you is to go back and investigate. Just don't take coffee's word at it. That's a challenge. But watch the writer here, and then perhaps we will get going. He says in verse 9, but, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accomplish salvation though, uh, through, uh, although we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forgive your works, your labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That you be not slowful, but followers of them uh, who through faith and patience inherit the promise. He said, for when God made promise to Abraham because he could, uh, uh, was, could uh, swear, swear by no greater, he swear by his himself, saying, surely, blessing, I will bless thee and multiply and I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men uh, verily swear by the greater, and an uh, oath of confirmation is to them, and the end of all strife. Wherein God will in more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise. Well, that, 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 now you got a lot, you ought to highlight that. Because we are heirs of promise. Now, you, could, you couldn't tell by the way we live, but we are. It says, we are Arabs of promise. He said that the, immutab the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. He said that by two immutable things, two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. That's one. He said it's impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who fled for refuge to lay a hole upon the hope set before us. Man, there's just so much meat in this. He says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, but sure and steadfast, which enter into the work within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, I, I'm going to make an attempt to preach this morning from uh, the subject, hope, the anchor of our soul. Now, that's not a short sermon. Uh, it's, it's a long sermon because you got to build. Because if you think about the word hope, that's one of those neglected subjects that the church usually talks about. You very seldom hear us talk about hope. What we do is we use the word hope, but we don't use it in the intent that the Scripture uses it. Because many of us, we don't go telling anybody, but we say, man, I sure hope I win the lottery. That's why you ain't never won it. Uh, I hope that I get this. Uh, I hope this. But, 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 but the writer here says that you and I are to have sure assurance, full assurance, rather, of hope. 
And when people have hope, they behave differently. Amen. I said a minute ago about this lottery thing. If you played the lottery last night and it's five million, wouldn't you act differently? You wouldn't have to tell nobody. We'd know that you wouldn't. You wouldn't walk around with your head all down. You wouldn't be complaining about your little problem. If you knew that you had five million dollars, you're gonna behave differently. Amen. I don't you don't have to say I know that. Some of us got income tax check coming this month. We acting different already. Calling people we ain't never called. What time you want to go to lunch, child? It ain't Dutch Street, baby. It's all on me. So, so, so when, when you got hope, the writer said when we got full assurance of hope, we don't act the same way. When you know for sure, you don't behave the same way. Your disposition changed. Your attitude changed. Everything changed. So what, 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 what gives us that hope? Is where we're going to go in a few minutes. But but it's just three little old elementary pr principles I'm going to be able to point out, maybe not get to them this morning. But, but, but when you have that hope, and that hope is not a materialistic thing, it's not sensual, it, it's heavenly. It's a, it's a broader sense of what it means to grow in hope in Jesus. Many times we talk about hope, it's not justified by the Scripture. Hope it can, can have a worldly connotation as well. But when the writer in Hebrews writes about hope, he's trying to raise expectations. When you got heavenly hope, your expectations r rise. If you have no hope, you don't have any expectations. Back again to the lottery. If you know you're going to win it and they paying out Monday, your expectation is great. Most of us, notice I got my hand up, who are not used to great material wealth, we done already bought four or five cars. We already done planned how many homes we're going to build. And last but not least, we plan what we're going to give to the church. That's after the cars and homes. Amen. So, 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 so the hope that we find or that we talk about is not necessarily what we build on. Look, let me show you something. You, you got your Bible. I really want to take my time. Look, but if I was going to use a separate title, let, let's go back to, uh, back to the text in, in, in Hebrews chapter uh, 6. And let's, let's start up at verse 4. I want, just for the sake of moving, if you don't mind. But let's start up in verse 4, after Paul is, or the writer, he said, he says in verse 4, he says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Now, you need to get this. He said, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Are you on the line? He said, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the power of the world to come. He said, if they shall all uh, uh, fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Now, he puts this here ahead of hope because what he's trying to do is get those Christians uh, in the, the Hebrews, those are Jewish, who, who are just about fed up with Christianity. There's some of us just about fed up with going to church. Being in worship is an afterthought. You notice that? Time changes, man. God understand. I'll get there. He know the. He know the time. Time didn't change. Man changed. 
God didn't change. <laughs> In other words, this is not an afterthought. And so we can't play God like that. If you got hope, your hope is has a broader expectation than just it being convenient. When people have hope, serving God is not a convenient matter. That's what drives your hope. And if that's driving your hope, coming to worship is not, not convenient, not a matter of convenience. I'll be where you want me in a minute. And so what we have to take a look at what does hope do? How do we get hope, and what, what does it do? What does it propel me to do? Our hope is it gives us a purpose. When you got hope, you got purpose. Hope gives us something to work for. Trust in God is a solid foundation. It gives us something, not only a purpose, but it drives our meaning of life. I do this because I have hope. And, and, and hope is one of those things that you and I have to take off some things, lay down some things, so that we can strive to be what God wants us to be. Now that sounds foreign because we're living in different times. But if we were living in the times that the writer was writing, it wouldn't be foreign. We don't have we don't have physical abuse to our faith like those folk did. They were walking across hot coals to, to keep up their faith. You don't have to have hot coal. Just throw a match on the ground. We're talking about, I ain't going to walk across that. See, we're living in different times. So, so faith, faith is not, uh, uh, hope is not one of those things that is flexible to society. Our, our hope should always be or remain the same. That's why the writer says in, in verse 19, he said, hope is an anchor. And you guys that fish, you know what an anchor, purpose of an anchor. You just don't put it on the boat just so you can say, I got an anchor. But when you stop, you put your anchor down. That's so you don't drift. Hope keeps us from drifting. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It's a challenge in this society to keep from drifting. Might as well be honest. It's a challenge. But you know what we do? One day we hot, next day we cold. A lot of time our, our conviction is based on how we feel that particular day. Some of us, some of us our attitude is even dictated by the weather. Are you, did you know that? You get up on a rainy morning, you feel sick. If the sun's shining, you feel like you can lift the world. I say that because when we talk about hope, it's pretty deep, and we have to learn to latch on. When the writer writes here, and I want you to get one more text from me, and then I'm going to try to develop a thought before I go. i got 20 minutes to do that. But turn with me, if you will, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is a good writing that, that Paul writes now, Paul writes this to the church that they obviously needed to be, but this eventually ends up with, with hope, with the idea of hope. Watch what Paul says. First Timothy chapter, uh, chapter 6 and verse 6. Paul said, he said, But godliness with contentment is what? It was true then, true now. But we, we, like I say, we're striving toward. We're trying to get. We're trying to. Uh, 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 we're trying to uh, gain more. He said, "For we bought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there, therewith." Content. But, and you always got to watch what they say after but. Man, that soup was good, but too salty. He said, but they that will be rich fall into temptations and snares and unto many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction 
and perdition. Now, that's true. And that's what, the, you see, that's what this world's competing for today. You say, well, because what about us? We see it. You live it every day. We're competing for that. And, and, and when we compete on that level for those materialistic and circular events, we lose our spiritual value of hope. It takes the edge off of hope. Now let me get to where I need to be, if you're okay with that. There are three reasons that I want to share this with you this morning. I may not get to all three of them, but I'll give you all three of them and try to come back and develop them. You okay? Smile. It ain't going to hurt. You know, act like you're taking a booster shot. It's all right. First, you write this down. If you want to increase your hope, only you can do that through God's word. It's not about what somebody has, not about what God has blessed you with. It's through standing on, this is your foundation, because you're going to need this when all else fails. Amen. The word of God. And so, because the Bible says in, in John 20, what's everything written for time? Written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have what? Things that were written for time. Were written for our learning. Where are we going to get hope? This is, this is what initiates our hope. Let me tell you something. You can preach and you can teach and you can have training classes and workshops about leadership, about everything else, but if they don't know this, there ain't going to be no hope. You can teach and preach and young people, but if they don't, if we don't inject this in their life, there will not be any hope. This is, this is where hope starts. You can stand up and holler until you, you, your head fall off your shoulder. If we don't inject this, this is our infusion. This is our foundation. If we're going to have hope, if we're going to stand when times get terrible and, and, and when the walls start falling in, this is our hope. When life gets tough, and it will, I was encouraging my grandsons, both of them, this morning. You don't want it handed to you. You want to work for it. Have some conviction. So when you get it, you can turn around and, and salivate in your accomplishments. The word of God. There are stories. The Old Testament. That let us know that life is not going to be what we want. But we have to have, continue to have hope. Stand on our hope. Problems aren't new. We hear people talk about, there's none, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. You can always, struggles have always been here, and they will always be here. Folk running off, committing suicide with the corona. Corona has always just got a different name. It has. Under Obama administration, it was pig flu. This corona here, this is the 19th version of corona. So it didn't just start if it, were, if it was 18 other virgins. So my, pro, my, my point is, is that there will always be problems. There's always going to be struggles. There's always going to be issues. What we have to do is stand on our hope because these things just didn't start. And there are some biblical examples of them. Loneliness. Most folk won't tell you that they struggle with loneliness. It's a psychological thing. 
You can be a room full of people and be alone. Loneliness is real. But we're not going to tell you that they, we feel lonely, but we don't want you to think we're crazy. But let me show you something. Boy, look at that time. Elijah was a lonely man. He said, Lord, I, I'm the only one left to serve you. God had to prepare a place for him, tried to get his mind right. Elijah had lost all hope, not because of some great sin, but because loneliness overtook him. Not only Elijah, David, same predicament. Not just David, Jeremiah. Same predicament. But God still have found them because there was a light of hope. What about unfairly? You know, because most of us, we, you treat us unfairly. You, you, could, you, you could fail to speak to some of us. And you, they, we feel like you done mistreated us. Let me tell you, were you upstaging me? Ain't nobody upstaging you. You didn't speak to me. Why didn't you speak to me? Speaking. But there, there was those who felt like they were treated unjustly, but some of them stood on, on, on their foundation of hope. Joseph, he definitely was treated unfairly. And not just by those on the outside. Not only that, those who had to deal with crisis, and whenever you deal with a crisis in your, you feel like you're taking it all alone. Crisis will steal your joy, and crisis will steal your hope. Daniel, Lord, here I'm doing everything. You got me. In, I'm, I'm, I'm hemmed up in this lounge den. How many of us feel like we've been in the lounge then? Daniel. Not only that, that was the three Hebrew boys. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Lord, you're going to let us be thrown in the furnace. Some of us feel like we've thrown in, been thrown in the furnace by family, friends, situations, circumstances. But God was there. And, I, and all I'm trying to drive this morning, church, is that problems and struggles will follow God's people just like it will the folk in the world. The difference is you got hope. They don't have the hope that you have. They, don't, they have a central materialistic, but you have a spiritual hope. And you know what? As Christians, we can remind God that we have hope. We can remind him. But too many times, we allow our circumstances to steal our joy. Amen. Some folks, there's nothing that God can do to, to replenish the joy that we should have. But some of us have just relegated ourselves to being angry, being upset. Talking to a brother yesterday. Or, or actually, he was a preacher from another denomination. Standing in front of me. He pulled out a sack. I thought he had his lunch in his pocket. He said, oh, no, these are pills. I said, pills? What kind of pills you got? Now, I take medication. He pulled out a sack. He must have 50 balls in there. He said, I have to carry it around like this. And I'm sagging. Taking around here. He had pills to wake up. Something to put him to sleep. Something to make him feel better during the day. And when he felt too good, he had to feel worse. I mean, man, you got too many pills. I say that because we are dependent on everything. But God, 
He says that he, the writer says that he is our anchor, and our anchor is our hope. You know what an anchor does? It stabilizes. It keeps us from floating. We might, even when a ship is, is, has an anchor down, it might drift, but it doesn't go far. It may drift a couple of yards this way, a couple of yards this way. That's what, that's what our hope does to us. We, we live in the world. We're real people. We're going to have some struggles, some issues, and we're going to drift, but we're not going to leave and trust in the Lord. That's what Solomon had said. He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And so we have to have. And then the Bible gives us hope. But then there's something else that ought to give us hope. And that's the cross of Christ. I said, Burkhoff, that's so far, and that's so far, and this, 2000, uh, this 2020, you're talking about the cross of Christ? If there was no cross, then you'd have excuse to not have any hope. But there was a cross, and Jesus was resurrected. And now he sits on the right hand according to the word, uh, sits on the right hand of God, making intercession. Do you know what he's doing? Pleading our case. Pleading it as a group. Pleading it as individuals. Pleading it as families. So he's busy. When I mess up and I repent, Jesus goes to the Father and says, Father, that's coffee. He doesn't mess up again. But he's come to us asking for forgiveness. God's sitting above like a judge at a bench, listening at the evidence, and he turns to his, the advocate, Jesus, our mediator, and says, case dismissed. Let him go. Give him another chance. Aren't you grateful for that? Aren't you grateful for that? And you know something? Who, who among us don't need forgiveness? All of us need forgiveness. Not just when, once a day, some, sometime all day long. Amen. Okay. And then the cross. Like I said, the cross gives us great hope. I'm, 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 I'm cutting up my lesson so I can get through it. But the cross gives us great hope. Uh, we, when we recognize and when we are convinced that Jesus died on the cross, but he went in the heart of the earth and was resurrected, that gives us great hope. Because we know that God not only loved him, but God loves us, and that the blood that Jesus said justifies us now when we are obedient to it, it cleans us up. And the fact that we are cleaned up, the fact that Jesus now is the, the Messiah and our Savior, the fact that he forgives us of our sins, that he stands on the right hand of God making intercessions, that ought to give us hope. And without hope in this life, Paul said, we are most miserable. That's why you got, we live in a society that's Always complaining. They don't have any hope. And, and you and I weren't eyewitnesses. But we can read about all of the, the majestic things that Jesus did to convince his followers, the 5,000 people that he fed, even the 5,000 that witnessed his resurrection, walking on water, all of these things, they give us hope that we serve a divine personality that is willing to be an advocate for us. And God knows we need it in this society. Amen. And then the assurance. The assurance that he was resurrected. Are you assured? I was, I was, I was, um, we, we were talking in a class, and I think that was, uh, class that Brother Starks taught at, uh, taught at one of our cottage meetings. Sometimes when you hear people say some things, they kind of just stay in your head. 
And I think our discussion that particular night was talking about God sees all of us. He sees us when we're mad, when we're upset, when we're all alone, when we're happy. Do you ever think of it that way? And I said, man, he sees he see me all the time. Don't make no difference how I am. He sees me. And all of the things that I may be able to hide from my brethren or hide from the church, God sees them. Little white lies, tell them I ain't here. God sees those. All of the other things that we do. But the fact that he is willing to forgive us, that ought to give us hope. A hope, not a, not a materialistic, but the fact that God loves us. And not only should it give us hope, but we are to be assured that the fact that Jesus was resurrected and sits on the right hand of God, now we have hope. And the Bible calls this a living hope. When Paul Peter writes about it, he said, this is a living hope, which ought to propel us to do better things. And because we have this living hope, living hope are to, according to Peter, that it ought to power us. We are powered through the faith of God. It ought to give us some, a special strength to be able to do those things that God wants. When it comes to serving the Lord in the church, when it comes to going out and doing evangelistic work, when it comes to loving our brothers and sisters, as we, see, see, now we have, the, we have a responsibility, but we have the resources to do it because we have hope. We have hope. Amen. And that hope should power us to greater levels. Our hope should lead us to be more consistent. You know what consistency is? When you have hope, that's what drives us to be consistent. Uh, coming to worship, and I talk about that all the time. Being in worship service, not just coming, but being involved in worship service. Hope drives you to do that. that that's what drives our consistency. Consistency means that you just continually do it. I'm talking Greek, aren't I? But some look like, But we ought to be consistent because Jesus died, because we have hope. It doesn't mean every once in a while. Let me tell you something. I want you to think about this. How many promises have God ever made to you that he's never kept? Not any. How many can you read about in his word that he promised that he never done? You know what that tells me? He's consistent. And the fact that you and I have hope, we have an assurance of hope, you and I are to be consistent. Not every once in a while. Some folks get, get, we get stirred up every once in a while. Man, I got to go to worship. And then, it, then on the other hand, we, every once in a while, that's not important. But God doesn't treat us like we treat him. We just take for granted. We make promises that we never keep. God has never made a promise to us that he has not kept. Amen. He promised to save us. He promised that he'd never leave us. He promised that he'd always be with us. And he always keeps his promise. He's consistent. And then when it comes to us, we feel like we don't have to be consistent. Now let me tell you something. I'm real. I'm a realist. There, there, there are things that'll trip you up. You can plan on being, you know, you can plan on being on work on time and run in a traffic jam, police hold you up. Cause you to be late. So, so there, there are things happen in life. 
Many of them happen you have no control over, but that should not divulge or disintegrate your consistency. Amen. Because God is consistent. He's consistent because of who he is. He's consistent in Jesus is because the scripture declares that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if we're going to experience victory, hope of victory, we need to be concerned about where we are this morning. Where are you? Where are you in your relationship with the Lord? Where, do you, does hope matter? Does it mean anything? Let me tell you, we have to be concerned about the issues because these are the things that are going to solidify our conviction as we move forward in this life. You see every day, if you watch TV, every day there's a different trouble arising in this country. Not only in this country, but around the world. This, this thing, this, 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 this thing that I mentioned earlier, this corona thing, most of us felt the same. Oh, it ain't going to In China, we don't live in China. God has a way of fixing every situation. I don't know how he's, what he's fixing. I know I prayed for him to make our country better, to have better leadership. That corona might be the way of doing it. I don't know that. I, I know there's some people that lost their lives, but even through that, Paul wrote in long ago in Romans 8, 28, he said, for all things work together for good. To them that love the Lord, to them that are called according to his purpose. He said, coffee, if you pray for it, let it work. Well, what about so-and-so? I'm not worried about that. Let God's business work. So I want to ask you this morning, where are you in your hope? Two people know, you and the Lord. Not coffee. Coffee don't know. God knows, though. If you're here this morning, you've been struggling. And let me tell you, you, you you've been struggling not because you don't want to be good, but you've been struggling because Satan is just so, so busy. He's doing his job. He want to keep you off balance, keep you frustrated, keep you blind. You want to have you blindfolded, not physically and literally, but many of us are blindfolded. We can't see. We like that old cliche. We don't hear nothing, don't see nothing, don't say nothing. But that's Satan's job. Think about where you are in your relationship. Think about hope, this word hope. Is it increasing or decreasing? Is it digressing? You're losing it. You don't have it. I know when I first obeyed the gospel, man, my hope was this high. You, you, you had, because the way that you were taught then, people you expect, had great expectations of people and they had the same of you. But then after being in a while, watching people, listening to expectations, I had my hope in the wrong thing. I had to go back and instill that trust in the Lord and not in people, not in situations, and not in circumstances. People change. They promise you, the child, I'll be with you the rest of your life. No, they, no, they won't. Long, long they can get something. you doing something for them. They might be with you. Now, if they were coming for a ride, don't let the car break down. I say that facetiously, but Jesus will always be there. So if you're here this morning, you're not a member of the body of Christ, you're not in the church, the church that Jesus died for, your hope has not yet been generated. Because for it to be initiated and generated, you have to obey Jesus. You have to obey him. The Bible says, so then faith come by hearing. Hearing what? By the word of God. What is it that we're to hear? We're to hear how God died. How he was bled and buried. How he was resurrected. And the Bible says, and that's according 
to the Scripture. Not according to any man, but according to the Scripture. Now, here we go with hope again. You can believe that, but you might not have any foundation of hope in that. And that's reflected in how you behave. But if you believe that and there's hope, that gives you hope when you read that. So behave differently. After you hear God's word and believe it, you must, you must repent of your sins. We got to get ourselves out of the way. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, except a man deny himself. Got to get out of the way. And pick up what? Which means that even if you, when you come in the church, even when you repent, even when you've been buried in baptism, there will be a cross to bear. Some of us don't want no bearing no cross. We think that when we can. Let me tell you something. If you're in the church, you're going to have cross to bear. If you're out of the church, you're going to have cross to bear. Only in the church, when you've got a cross to bear, you've got hope. Don't have no hope bearing your cross out there. And then after you hear and believe, you must repent. Baptism is what puts us in Christ.